My name is Andrew Pulver. Uh, I work for the Guardian newspaper. I'm a film critic and writer. And this, uh, as you probably know, is Pavel Pavlikovsky. Obviously, Serbian epics is about many things, um, most obviously the Bosnian War. But ostensibly, it's also about poetry, which is something that probably gets a little overlooked. So I'm just interested to know what your um, interest in poetry is and how it transfers to your screen work. To be specific about Serbian epics, I'm not terribly interested in Karadzic's poetry, although it was an interesting way into the film. And the oral epic poetry of the Serbs, it seemed to me at the time to be like an interesting key to the whole question. Key is too much said, but an interesting framework to the question of what was happening in the Balkans, especially in the heads of the, of the Serbs. So I read the oral epics, the medieval oral epics, and I kind of discovered at the heart of the, the, you know, the, the, the myth, the Serbian kind of f foundation myth, the desire to, to win gloriously. And it sort of somehow tied in with, the, with, with what was happening in 1991 and 92 when the war was starting. I used it partly as a kind of starting point to explore the, the idea of nationhood. I mean, to, to put it in a nutshell, you know, the Serbs they didn't have a statehood for 600 years almost, and they recreated the, the identity and the, the, lang the language on the basis of, of, of oral epic poems, which were collected by a romantic peasant poet, Vuk Karadzic, and that became, um, that became like a foundation stone of, of the rediscovered identity. Then I discovered also that Karadzic came from a family of oral epic poets, so his father was one and his brother was one. It was a fantastic Trojan horse, you know, you go to the war zone, you know, it's full of media chaos and, and nobody trusts anybody, and you come as a kind of some kind of idiot who, like flying, catching butterflies, <laughs> and, and you're just interested in oral epic poetry. And it did, in a weird way, help me to actually get to the central command, you know, to the heart of darkness of the war, because the Serbs PR people who, who I came across at some point, uh, who all, by the way, were failed poets, um, they, they kind of, they, they thought, oh, this is weird guy who just wants to make a film about, about our great culture. Being interested in oral epic poetry actually got me first in touch with uh, Professor Kolievich, who was a member of the Serbian um, government, and then and I got into the company of, of uh, Karadovan Karadzic, who was really tickled that I was interested in, uh, in oral epic poetry. It was like an intellectual starting point and a, and, a, and a kind of strange excuse for the whole film. And also it, it, it allowed me to make a film for Bookmark, BBC's literary program. I had no contacts at the BBC apart from uh, Nigel Williams was the head of Bookmark, and I said to Nigel, "Listen, I just want to make a film about Bosnia, and I have a literary angle. You know, it's going to be something to do with poetry and <laughs> and oral epics. And by the way, Karadzic wrote some poems. It wasn't really my interest in poetry that <laughs> that led me to make this film. But the way I made it, I didn't want it to be a film that's narrative in any way, or I didn't want it to be verite. I wanted to make it out of like strong." scenes and images, you know, just to like a mosaic of stuff. And the structure was going to be not narrative, but more musical. You first show kind of kind of vaguely innocent stuff, but resonant and powerful, and it gets madder and madder. What really turns me on in films is, is, is strong images and moments. The narrative less so, because narrative, you know, usually quite predictable. But if I can make films made out of strong moments and images and just put them side by side, and it somehow evokes something, and in the spaces between the scenes and between the cuts, something happens in people's imagination, that's, for me, cinema. The idea was that, you know, we just put stuff side by side and the overall impact is not about the story and it's not about like human interest or psychology of the characters but it's a kind of mosaic that adds up in some way and that has a musical rhythm rather than rather than the narrative one in my last film Ida, i also tried i mean there's a story there of course but i also tried to make it out of like strong chunks you know like strong strong moments and just to avoid um avoid blinking too much or explaining too much, just just hoping that, um, you know, just putting these things together will evoke something in people's heads. And that's why all my films are so bloody short, you know, because I keep distilling them and everyone's uh, <laughs> asking why they're so short. My first assembly is shorter than my final film, you know, because I just go for the, the really kind of strong bits. You know. And my editor of these films is sitting over there, Stefan, and he knows how, how it all works. When I was doing the tripping with Zhirinovsky, there was this kid with a VHS camera who was hanging around all the time. And he was shooting Zhirinovsky in all sorts of situations. And he was just shooting Zhirinovsky, picking his nose or you know, doing something 
idiotic. And, and then he was going around all the agencies and selling his VHSs and saying, this is Zhirinovsky <laughs> hypnotizing a chicken. You know, do you, you, can have it for, you can have it for $100. And a lot of the image that Zhirinovsky acquired in, 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 the, uh, in the media at the time was created by that boy with a VHS camera. And, and I just thought it was quite, quite a funny starting point for a totally different story. And whereas Zhirinovsky, the, the documentary you now has a certain kind of structure and, and, and it's impressionistic largely. And it's not a very deep film because the character is not very deep. So the film, you know, it has no, not many layers. One of the reasons I stopped making documentaries was, was this tripping with Zhirinovsky because I thought I, I can't actually get it very much through documentaries. I'm looking at stuff, photographing it and putting it together, but I'd much rather make fiction and get you know, deeper into people's heads. And I just stopped making documentaries after, after the Zhirinovsky film. I always felt Polish as a person, but as a filmmaker, it's, you know, hard to <laughs> judge. Well, I was living in Britain at the time, you know, living, working, I had a family here, but I always tried to look at it mm, less sociologically than British directors, slightly against the grain in terms of themes that were mm, interesting to me, you know, like love, transcendence, or lack of love. And I always found Britain quite exotic, you know, uh, so, so I tried to show it as something quite exotic. But in terms of themes that interested me, I mean, the first was Last Resort, which is about exile and about how, you know, this kind of weird experience of arriving somewhere where you don't understand the rules of the game. It's I was driving bad. around a lot with a, yeah. with a camera and along the, I went to Hastings and Cromer and all sorts of places. And in Margate, it suddenly, it clicked that this is a great place. And it was, and it was a mixture of things. I had a, a, a story which I was writing about a mother and child who arrived in, in Britain. That was one story. And then I was obsessed with these kind of, these uh, seaside resorts where all life had left. And uh, which once were you know, seaside resorts where people went, and now they're mainly places where you put refugees in. And when I came across Margate, I, and I, I just, I, just I, I liked it a lot. You know, I, I stopped in some hotel, met a lot of Slo Slovakian gypsies, and started seeing the world through their eyes, you know, because they, were, they didn't quite know where they were. They called Margate Maragate. And also in Margate, there were all these like, British people who were uh, just kind of lost there, you know, like lost souls, a bit like the character of Alfie in my film. And I couldn't deal with British life head on. So I was looking at, you know, exiles, refugees, teenagers, mad people, just looking at something that's expressive and strong and, and that helps me deal with certain themes which, which I, you know, which I wanted to, which were on my mind. My documentaries were signed Paul Pavlikovsky because I thought there is all these W's, you know, that's going to end in tears. But then when I finished Last Resort, my editor then, David Charap, um, he said, you know, you can't put Paul in your, in the credits, you know, because we call you Pavel. He spoke Czech, so he could say Pavel. Everyone calls you Pavel, you know, it's absurd that it should be Paul. So he actually forced me to put the name Pavel <laughs> on, on the credits. What's moving back to Poland given you? It wasn't so much moving back to Poland, although that too, but moving back in time, where uh, life was simpler, people were more expressive, where people were shaped by history, and, and especially Poland, of course, where, you know, history was everything. So moving back into the 60s, that was the big, big, big decision. Obviously, my idea of Polishness is, is not contemporary. It's, it's part nostalgia, part uh, some fantasy about... Uh, uh, you know, a world which never was, possibly. When I was making documentaries, I was really curious about the world out there. And not just curious, but turned on. I was young, I was a cowboy, you know, I went somewhere, disappeared for months and, you know, shot some film and came across really expressive, interesting characters that I couldn't have found in London. But also I was, you know, talking about Eastern Central Europe, which was where I came from, which, which was like some unfinished business. I was too scared to make films in Poland because I was too hung up about Poland. I couldn't, I, you know, I was too self-aware when I was thinking about Poland. But that was that time in my life. Then I made films like Last Resort about exile and My Summer of Love, First Love, just things which were kind of universal and, you know, were on my mind. With Ida, I just became really interested in, in um, questions of identity, faith, you know, and who, who I am, what makes us who we are, my, um, our choices, the, this, the force of history, you know, which, which one doesn't feel quite so viscerally these days, but in the 60s it was still kind of, it was still very... Uh, very, very much uh, present. I always made films about stuff that it interested me at, at the time. And for the last uh, four years, you know, I've been thinking about, about the past and Poland. It was partly a result of making a film in Paris, The Woman in the Fifth, which was a, a film 
with an identity problem. You know, it was a it was a film with a, a, an American hero in Paris, made by a pole. Uh, there's a Polish girl in it. Uh, there's a ghost in it. There is a, a French crew. Culturally, it didn't add up at all. You know, and uh, and also it's neither a thriller nor a naturalist film, nor is it a David Lynch film. I love that film, but it's deeply solipsistic and it doesn't really connect with the with the, with, the, with the audience or critics even. So Ida was like a, a desire to return to some firm ground, you know, to something I really know that's culturally coherent. It was a, a Polish film with Polish crew, Polish actors, and the music of my childhood and landscapes of my childhood and um, and these questions of you know Polishness, Jewishness, these ter- you know th- these questions. Um, so it felt really, really familiar, and uh, it made me very confident. And, and when you're confident about the whole thing, you're very confident about the form as well. So I felt very, uh, it was a kind of, re- I don't know whether it was a return, but it was like uh, I got st- onto some firm land, you know, after you know, being a little bit lost for a while. So for me, there's like an element of writing, in a period of writing, and then the adventure of the film, which is also writing in a way. So looking for landscapes, Photographing, looking for actors, then writing a, a rewriting, then looking for more actors, more landscapes, rewriting. So I include casting and location scouting into the whole process of inventing the film. Because for, for me, the, the, the interesting thing about, thing about films is inventing. It's not the writing of the script. It's like inventing the whole thing, and that's a kind of adventure. But I like keeping it open, you know. And without the right actors, of course, you know. I don't believe in it. You know, when I look through the viewfinder, I have to really kind of feel that this is it. Not just that it's realistic, but that it's expressive and I like it. And it's not just some kind of actor acting pages from script. So for me, you know, that, that physical adventure of driving around, looking, casting, uh, living the film for a year or two, it's, it's as important as, as kind of, you know, inventing the basics of the story. And usually it impacts on the story. You know, I usually kind of change stuff and but that that's what i like about cinema so so i I give myself that freedom and that freedom comes from that from the period where i was making documentaries where i really i kind of had a hunch i had a you know idea that i like this place i like this subject this character but i didn't quite know how to sculpt it all together but i had confidence that if the thing inside is strong and i don't lose my nerve it's going to be it's going to be fine so casting and all that is just part of the whole process of inventing the film are you sort of wary about going more mainstream, as it were? The good thing about the <laughs> my last film, which you know got a lot of acclaim and an Oscar, is that I can make a totally unwatchable film now, and and people might still go and see it. You know, so so I'm not wary at all. I'm, I've done my commercial bit. Now I can <laughs> go off off the off piste. When it came out in Poland first, you know, it was fine. And with the Oscars, it became very uh, prominent, and suddenly it became a, an excuse for some political forces to to make noise. There was a petition against the film, or not against the film, but petition in favor of putting a caption at the beginning of the film explaining the whole Second World War. And these people, you know, they of course didn't count on this caption being ever done, but they gained notoriety, and, and the world heard that there is such a such an organization. I just realized that that's part of this visibility, you know, that's what happens. And then there were other people who accused my film of being anti-Semitic. In the New York Times there was this article, what is this film that's both anti-Polish, anti-Semitic, you know. So, you know, with all these characters, I wonder whether there was some kind of thread that was um, motivating you to, to look at them, you know, or, or with each of these kind of uh, documentaries. I mean, there definitely characters who, who are at odds with the world are good characters. Full stop. You know, they're the, they're the characters who have energy and who you want to watch because they disrupt the order <laughs> of things. I like p- people who are disruptive and uh, and 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 who don't accept the world as it is or who want something badly that's totally uh, unavailable. That's what's yeah, what's what's interesting. What what tells you know, generates good stories as well and all sorts of layers. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, because you famously say that you didn't know anything about documentaries before making them, um, but did you watch documentaries at that time? Yeah, I did watch documentaries, but I didn't theori- theorize about them. And, and I watched them when I didn't know I'd be making films, you know? I remember like a big moment when I watched documentaries, where I was confronted with really good documentaries when 82, when BBC showed these Polish documentaries from the the banned ones from the 70s and uh, 60s and 70s. I was kind of to- <coughs> totally bowled over by what you can do with documentary. When I got to make them, when I got uh, this 
strange job at the BBC. I, I really, when, you know, I knew this is the BBC, so you make documentaries in a certain way where people talk for a while and there's some pictures, and actuality, they used to call it. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. So maybe I was disingenuous when I said that I didn't know how documentaries were made. I just decided not to, not to worry about, you know, what sort of documentaries I'm making. I was wondering, when you finish your films, do you ever think back and say, gee, I wish I had done that differently? If I only had thought of that, and why did I put that in? And what is your relationship with your editor? Maybe you should ask him. I mean, I mean, uh, Stefan edited these three out of these four documentaries, so I think we clashed a bit, no? I remember he, Stefan went to, into his garden and with his electric guitar and just played for a long time. And <laughs> just like, just I try not to watch my old films, you know, because I, I suffer, you know. I, I, every time I, I recently showed uh, to some students, like, first ten minutes of Last Resort, which, you know, uh, which was supposed to be good, and I, and I watched it, and I thought, what the hell was I thinking? You know, why cut this? You know, why this shot? You know, so I thought, oh, okay, it doesn't matter what I think. It, the only thing that matters is what, what happens in the heads, minds of the audience, you know, and if they like it, then fine. And also you change, you know, it's not that, you, well, you learn the craft more, and you, you know, you're, you know, more sophisticated, more, you know, make fewer mistakes, uh, but also you just change as a person, you know, your metab metabolism changes, your temperament changes, your sense of humor changes or disappears even sometimes. Uh, so, you know, so all these films, um, they kind of reflect more or less where I was at the time, technically, but also mentally, you know, so. And, and to be honest, I, uh, I mean, and Stefan will bear this out, I never actually go with, you know, I d never let the editor edit, <laughs> just, uh, just, the, or do, just edit this and I'll come back into the catering. I'm just sitting there and torturing, you know, the poor people and, and just, you know, supervising every cut. You worked with quite a lot of different actors from different background, Russian actors, Polish actors, British actors, uh, non-professional, professional, professional fr from theatrical background. What are the differences how actors actually work on, on a set? Mm -hmm. And uh, your personal, um, I don't know, um, ways to work with actors? I don't see it as a, as a particular craft, you know, working with actors. I just try to cast actors or non-actors that I like, you know, that I respond to quite intuitively, you know. So there's no philosophy to it. It's more like reacting to, uh, I like this person, this person doesn't interest me. When I watch films of directors, uh, other directors, I, I always have the feeling that I can, I know most about the character of the director by looking at who they cast. It's a real key to, to personality of the director. So, so I choose basically people, whether they're actors, non-actors, who I just respond to. And if I haven't found them, then I don't start the film, uh, usually. How do you uh, actually work with actors? I mean, Russian theatrical school is very different. I impose my own Ah, you do. Chaos, <laughs> chaos on them. I remember working on L Last Resort with a really great Russian actress, yeah, Dina Korsun, yeah. and she was desperate because I was like t stripping her down, so to speak, and not giving her the script sometimes, you know, and, and sometimes giving her the script and just being really manipulative to, to get away from this kind of great acting, you know, from, the, from this very beautiful technical acting that the, you learn at the Moscow Arts yeah, Theatre. It's not a method I use, it's a, like every actor has different, or every person you work with has different problems, <laughs> or different. Or you press different buttons to make it work. The only thing that matters is what's uh, in front of the camera, or what you see through the viewfinder, you know? So uh, there's no science to it at all. You develop a relation, you cast well, it, and everyone knows, if you cast them, everyone knows that the way I work, that. They're not there because I couldn't get some other actor. They're there because they're totally essential to the film. And that gives everybody confidence, you know, that they are part of this uh, uh, process and this world. And then I would work it, work it until it works, you know. So we're not just knocking off pages of script and this actor does it well, this actor doesn't. Too bad, we'll cut up way out of the problem later. Uh, you know, we don't work like that. Did it work like that on Woman and the Fifth? Because there were actually two fairly famous actors who presumably would yes. weren't quite as, man, you know, manipulable in your words as... as yeah, I cast them uh, very... Pff, because I wanted them. I, you know, I knew Ethan and, and he was like perfect for that character and he was totally, we were totally kind of symbiotic. With Christine Scott Thomas, she, had a, she was playing a bloody ghost, you know, so it's kind of tricky for an actor, but so it's a bit more technical, you know, how... Well, ghost or some, somebody who's not quite, um, not quite emotionally there. But yes, uh, of course, that being a bigger budget film, you know, and, and time is more expensive, so you can't mess around quite 
to the degree I, I, I would like to. But, uh, but in principle, yes, I work with, like that with everyone, if you, if, you, if, the, if you really want them. I mean, if, if they're the actors you need. How long did these two documentaries that we've seen to make, and how long time did it take to get up and close before they relaxed, before they let, you, they let the guard down? I didn't think they let the guard down at all, and I didn't want them to. You know, mm. I just used them as like figures in the landscape. You know, I don't, I don't think I we get to know anything about Karadzic in this film, and it's not a not a film about Karadzic. It's a kind of he's one of the elements. And with him, I mean, this, with this Serbian epics, I took a, you know I spent a bit of time there. The actual filming days were very few because the stuff I wanted to film was so difficult to get to, and I didn't want to just film warfare, which is kind of like what everyone else films. So, um, so it took a bit of time. Preparing and and uh, and the filming days were maybe I don't know twelve or something, but I was there for quite a while twice, um, and nobody dropped their guard. You know that wasn't I didn't want to get close to them yeah. as people. You know it was like that wasn't what a film was about. And with Zhirinovsky more so. These fools on the boat. You know there was just a comedy. And um, I, but at the same time when you saw these kind of masses of people at the quayside, you know these toothless, hopeless masses waiting for some guy in a white suit to promise them <laughs> access to the Indian Ocean or free vodka, you know, that, that it wasn't, you know, it was funny, but it's, it's tragic too, of course. And on that boat, we were there for quite a few days, but they wouldn't let us film anything for a while, you know, they, they, they were just kind of there and they just kind of got used to us after a while. And because they were so bored on the boat, you know how cruises are, you know, in the end, they kind of let us film a bit. And you know. so when you were young, what inspired you? Like what made you begin and set out to pick up the camera and do the work that you do now? You know, I was a failed musician, failed poet, failed photographer, failed everything. <laughs> so, so all the roads led to filmmaking, clearly. <laughs> no, I was, I was into music. I, you know, music was my main passion for a long time. Piano. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I loved poetry. I wrote some, you know, terrible poetry. And I, and I like taking photographs, you know, there was all sorts of things. And I just liked, you know, observing and traveling. So, you know, there wasn't like a clear career path. It was more, I, was, I knew I was a genius of some kind, you know, but not, not clear. What. And um, <laughs> then, then at some point I joined a f um, filmmaker's workshop in Oxford. You know, and, and, uh, and then I got a traineeship at the BBC, which was a kind of lucky break. The little films I did in Oxford, they were like deeply poetic, you know, talking about poetry. They were like, they were like visual equivalents of poems. And, and what was great about getting to make films, documentaries for the BBC, that it got me out of myself. You know, I could make films about other things that had that I liked. It was a liberation, you know, to go out into the world and shoot shoot other uh, people and monsters and stuff. But it was always, you know, like the film about Serbs is in a very roundabout way is a film about Poland, you know. It's about just national myth-making, you know, about how far can it go when it goes far. <laughs> and I grew up in a very patriotic environment in Poland. So when I saw the Serbs, I thought, that's an extreme version of, <laughs> of what I grew up with. And I wasn't totally dismissive of it, you know. I mean, it's a very ambiguous film, you know. I'm just thinking, you oh, know, that kind of making sense of the world is not specific to the Serbs, you know. In fact, when I was in Texas during the Iraq war, you know, I was listening to these people and listening to the radio stations. So their myth-making is just endemic. I just want to say, ask everybody to show their appreciation for Pavel. And, um, Thank you. Thank you.